Okay, so if you want to follow along, you can open, if you're in Leipzig or in Weimar, you can, you're welcome to open any of the two. Go to the course page, the current date, and here is the notebook that we'll be going through. If you want to follow along in the Jupyter notebook that we provided, you can just follow these steps. You can copy the link address, go to um, Jupyter File Explorer homepage, open up a new terminal, and we can run wget control shift v to paste. Just press enter, that will download that. Now it downloaded it again for me because I already have it, so don't mind that. Go here again. And for good measure, we'll just shut down that terminal by going to the running tab. And we can open the Jupyter Notebook. Again, let me start by making this a bit wider for my own sanity. Um, so if you were here last time, we went through some basics of the Jupyter Notebook of the Python, Python standard library, but if you really want to get ahead in machine learning, especially, you will want to use a few more libraries. Now there's a, there's a whole bunch of libraries and you will definitely find a library for whatever use case you have. Um, what we will introduce in this current session is actually three things, NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. Now this session won't be enough for you to get up to speed and learn everything you need to know um, in these modules, but it, it, it's more of a showcase of what they can do and what you should use them for. And the recommendation is as always to go through these resources and the sources at the same time for this notebook and just work through the examples yourself. This is just really a, a quick tour. Um, we start out by looking at the resources. The, the, the four first resources are the same as last time. They haven't changed. I've included a couple of linear algebra resources if you want to uh, refresh your memory because some people mentioned they'd like um, such resources. So the matrix cookbook is a free PDF from 2012, linear algebra hasn't changed much since. And it's basically everything that you would need in nice bite-sized excerpts. Uh, another resource is the Goodfellow book, which is a deep learning book, but that starts out with uh, needed math and linear algebra that, that, you, that you should master before you you go further in the field, I heavily recommend that book in general and that chapter in particular. And these two cheat sheets, which we recommend that you also work through, one for pandas, very nice cheat sheet, much better than any tutorial that I could ever give you, and one for NumPy. So what are NumPy and what is pan, what, what are NumPy and pandas? Originally, Python was not designed for numerical computing, and as the adoption of Python started to grow, so too did the need for numerical computing. Now, there, there is an array uh, object in Python. I've never used it myself. I don't know anyone who uses it. People use NumPy for that, which is a library for, uh, for, for multidimensional arrays and matrices and linear algebra operations on those. We have pandas, which is if you have ever worked in R or in Excel, a lot of people will frown for hearing me mention that, but it's basically numerical tables with, la with labels and, and, and indexes. Uh, and finally, we will go through the a few very um, very few basics of the matplotlib plotting library and I'll provide resources to other um, toolkits within the Python visualization field that are also used and that are also very useful. We might include 
some of those in a future session. So one thing that you should know in Python is that there are conventions as to how you name packages when you import them. You always have to name, always, no questions asked. You always have to import pandas and give it the alias PD. Uh, you always want to import NumPy as an MP. This thing you will not usually do. I've included it so that we can look at a few lower level things of matplotlib, but when you do import the entire matplotlib package, you import it as MPL, and what we'll usually use is the scripting submodule that is pyplot, and we always import that as PLT. I'll go ahead and press Shift Enter to to um, to run that cell, and we can move on to the NumPy section. We already saw lists last time, just normal, vanilla, standard library lists. We saw that they could contain any type we want. We could mix types. We could do whatever we want. Now, NumPy things are different because the containers that NumPy provides, the arrays, which are also called tensors in other libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow, which also means that you can basically use PyTorch and TensorFlow as just a glorified NumPy with, of course, the uh, nooks and crannies needed to, uh, to provide more functionality. And Quick these... interruption. Um, somebody is asking in the chat when we need to plot something, is it okay to use R instead of Python? Um, I would say, uh, sure. So if you have uh, some task as part of the exercise where the task is simply to produce some plot, then it doesn't matter what you use. You could also throw the data into Excel and use that to, to make a chart if uh, that is what you prefer and what you are familiar with. You can also use for Plotly, the... which is probably nicer than the Plotly. Yeah. Uh, for the programming exercises, uh, please stick to Python. Not that there's anything wrong with R, of course. I, I do understand the, the preference for R in terms of plotting. The ggplot experience is, is a much nicer one than matplotlib, I have to say. There's actually a Python port of that. But the last time I tried it, it worked only so-so. I've never tried it. Is, it. is it an official port or is it just an afternoon project that was never developed further? Last time I tried it, uh, that was a couple of years ago, and it looked more like the latter, but mm. maybe it has advanced by now. Um, okay, so back to NumPy. As I said, these arrays are typed, and they can only hold one kind of, of, of um, a variable, and the types of these variables are quite close to those you find in C. You can visit this page that I've included a link to in the uh, notebook to see what types you can use. These are all native to NumPy as well. If you're doing something that's very performant, you might want to look further, uh, closer into what types you're actually using, but we're not going to worry about that. So what can we do? We can create uh, zero dimensional arrays, otherwise known as, known as scalars. If we call the endim attribute on that um, scalar, it tells us that there are no dimensions. It's a scalar. It's a zero D array. It has no shape, so it's an empty shape. And we can also ask NumPy to tell us what type of value this array can store. We can go up to one dimensions. If uh, if you if you want to be very strict, you'd call this rank rather than dimension, to be honest. So a zero, a, a one rank, a rank one tensor array, but no, not a problem for us. Again, one dimension as we expect. Shape is a is one of five. Same D type. Now oh, an interesting. Uh, feature of, of NumPy is that you can broadcast arithmetic operations. So if you look at the Y array, and if I add one, it just adds one to all elements. 
I would recommend you go to this link here to see how broadcasting works because there are a few rules for when it works, basically when the dimensions either are the same, um, like on the inner side that they have to match or uh, one of the dimensions is one and that it can be repeated. Um, we can also square it. We can also call math functions inside of uh, NumPy, just randomly stack them and they will all be applied um, element by element. Now, just um, if, if we remind ourselves how we could have done this just using the standard uh, library, let me copy this here and create a normal Python list. And if I wanted to square every element like I did in this line, I would do something like uh, list comprehension and do like element squared for every element in L. And yeah, let's print that because this is ugly because the display function somehow doesn't know how to display a list. And we see that we get the same result in a much uglier and less intuitive way if you want to do math and don't want to think more about um, well, the coding aspect. We can go up to matrices or rank two tensors. There we have to give the array function a list of lists, every list corresponding to a row. We expect it to have dimension two, four rows and five columns in terms of shape. and an int 64 D type. Now notice that we got float 64 here when I just gave it floats, it would have sufficed for one item to be a float for it to, to have the entire thing be a float array. Uh, let us define a few more arrays. All rank two, even this one, because we provided a list of lists the plural here being uh, not very meaningful because it's just one list inside that list, but we defined the fact that we want to rank two tensor here. So we have, well, three matrices. We can define a range using a range, arithmetic range. Is it arithmetic range? I always assume it's arithmetic range. I'm not sure what it actually stands for. I thought array range. Ah, good point. Goes to show how much I know. Um, yeah, array range, of course. Again, if you don't remember this, let's just introspect objects in the pager at the bottom of the screen with more examples and things you can do with it. Um, you can slice an array no matter what the rank, you can get this notation here and apply it however you want, as long as it includes these two semicolons, if you want all three. We can get the first five elements, the elements after the fifth index, you can get a random slice of the middle of it, items four, five, six. You can get every other element because, well, the default is, if we, if, if we don't provide start and stop values, it will just provide every other element in case the step is two. You can get every other element, but if you specify the starting index, you get, you start at index one. If you choose a step of minus one, then you reverse the thing. Now notice this is just a view of the, of the X array. You can get every other entry in reverse format, starting from index five. You can do the same for matrices. Let's define the X2 matrix. We use the np.random.randint, int, which provides random integers between 0 and 10. 10 not inclusive, so 
basically until up until nine and we give it the shape that we wanted to have using the size parameter so we want three three rows and four columns in our matrix it's an array but i'm calling it a matrix there's there is also a matrix object in numpy but i i don't personally think it's worth using a and dimensional array with n equal to is just basically the same thing we can get the first row if we just provide one index if we provide two indices separated by comma then we index on row and then on column and we get element so basically index zero for this row and then index one for this element we can slice the same way using the comma and the columns in the respective places. So rows up until not including two and columns up until but not including three. You can also use double column notation to skip columns and reverse them to get one column or one row. Once you have a two-dimensional, um, two two-dimensional arrays, you can you can perform matrix operations on them. You can use the at uh, symbol to 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 uh, to perform the dot product or the matrix multiplication, or you can use the uh, the native dot dot uh, attribute function, which provides the same thing. You can reverse that because the dimensions allow us to do that. 2, 3, and 3, 2. You can use at notation for the inner product. Let's remind ourselves what the V is. And you can calculate the outer product. There are different ways to initialize arrays. You can, I hear this is called array range. You can use that with also start, stop, and step size to create a range that jumps two elements at a time. You can create another sort of range where you want a list of numbers between zero and one uh, identically spaced from one another, and you want 10 of them. So what way this is how you would slice the zero one interval in 10 values. So this is usually used for plotting. You can split the interval between zero and pi into four. And if we calculate the cosine of that, we get the values we'd expect. We can create scalar um, uh, arrays of whatever shape we want filled with zeros by calling the np.zeros function which is the same as providing this shape because usually the shape has to be an interval usually a tuple but it can also be a list i prefer myself the tuple notation you can create a matrix of zeros using the same function can create a rank three tensor of zeros. You can do the same thing with one. If you have an array and you want something that has the same shape but it's full of ones, you can use the ones like function that gives you an array that's the same shape as your input but filled with ones. You can also create an identity matrix using the I function. So that's a matrix with a one on the diagonal. You can shift that as well by giving it the shape of it. So five, seven, and one off the diagonal. And just for demonstration six, we can also, for all these functions, explicitly tell it what type we want it to have. So in this case, I'm choosing a N16. The other random functions you can generate the uh, items from a uniform distribution, so between zero and one. In this case, 
the unit uniform distribution n of shape 4, 3. And that gives you a random matrix. You can choose a Gaussian distribution of mean 0 and variance 1. And uh, it'll give you the, the appropriately sized matrix, but with elements sampled from a, from a bell-shaped curve. So what operations can we perform on these arrays? Well, let's remind ourselves what M1 looks like. It's a matrix. Matrices have transposes that just switch the rows and the columns. And, and the T attribute notation is just an alias for the np.transpose function of the, of the NumPy module. We can flatten it, so create a, 1D, a vector out of it, just squeeze it. You can also reshape uh, matrices. So that it returns an array containing the same data with a new shape if you want to, uh, let's see. So the equivalent of Flatten would be actually not this because this is still a 2D. There. You can sum the elements of an array. So M1 being this, if we sum all elements, we, we get 21. Now this is maybe not what you would like to do because there, as we said, a, two, a rank two tensor array has rows and columns. We might want to perform these operations according to a given axis. And this is where this notation that's going to be with you in all your, in your uh, interactions of, of, of scientific Python, this axis notation that can be a bit confusing. I still have to look up these, these, these axes all the time when I'm, when I'm coding, especially in pandas, when you want to apply a function to a row, to a column. So it's, it's, it's useful to have um, like an anchor to remind yourself that, for example, in a 2D array where we have rows and columns, axis zero, remember usually you, I and J stand for rows and columns. So if you zero index is zero and one, zero corresponds to the rows, and axis one corresponds to the columns. If you have a 1D array, there's only one axis, so that's zero. If you have a 3D array, so uh, many matrices, you have rows, columns, and the depth. So if you have images, for example, this will be your pixels, and axis two will be your R, G, and the third one would have been B. And we can use this axis zero, axis one, the sum across these axes. Let's remind ourselves what M is. So if we sum across rows, we get one of one plus four equals five, five plus two equals seven, six plus three equals nine. We can sum across columns and the equivalent of calling sum with no arguments is basically calling axis equals none, meaning that we don't want to use the axes, just give me everything. You can call many functions using this notation. You can call the mean, give, uh, According to a given axis, you can call the variance, you can call the variance presumably with none. And actually to see what you can perform, what sort of functions you can perform in an array or any Python objects. We remember we call the dir, dir function on it. We see the transpose attribute. And if we go down, we can see all the functions that are available. Quite a lot of them. Uh, but there are more functions, linear algebra, specifically related functions. Let's define a new matrix, 0, 1, 2, 3, two rows and two columns. And you can call the function inverse from the np.linearalgebra package. And you can just inverse the matrix and multiplication gives you an identity matrix. Um, just a hint, 
you might also see people go uh, using uh, SciPy. Uh, SciPy. And this is the same package because the these two pro the SciPy scientific Python project and the NumPy project are very closely related. SciPy builds on NumPy, and this is where NumPy originally lived, I believe. And for people who just want to use the array structure, it was taken out of SciPy and just bundled into its own NumPy project. But this thing contains all the functions that, that are contained in NumPy, linear algebra, and a few others that you might use in um, physics or signal processing or things like that. So just keep that in mind if, uh, if you find that you need a function that's not available in here, it might be available in here. Um, so uh, that's it for NumPy. I probably missed a lot of things. One thing that I would encourage you to uh, look into is fancy indexing. So indexing not just with linear ranges, but like with strides and many other ways. Or Einstein notation indexing with, this is one of my favorite things to use, even though it's not particularly useful. I just find it pretty enough to uh, waste time trying to figure out how to use and you might find it useful as well just give you a little preview that probably no one is interested in but if you have some background in physics you'll be used to uh, Einstein notation and by providing the indices i and j and different uh, combinations of them, you can come up with very advanced ways to index and combine different axes over NumPy. But anyway, um, so that's it for NumPy. Uh, Is Einstein questions? notation Turing complete? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've actually used this before for some information retrieval experiment where it made sense I don't remember why but there is there is only one time I remember using it I'm not particularly sure when it what exactly it was but I couldn't figure out how to how to do what I wanted to do and I had to just explicitly use Einstein notation but uh, the, there's a tool that I know exists for TensorFlow for its NumPy API so I'm sure it exists for um, for uh, for NumPy and it's just this thing where you give it two two tensors and you give it the output and it will just using some magic behind the scenes it will tell you what operations you need to chain to uh, like to come up with it. Nice. Okay. Uh, any questions, remarks, tips, things you'd like to? I don't Say see about any it. further questions so far. Maybe one thing related to the fancy indexing stuff mm -hmm. would be to, to point out that this is quite useful to um, generate training test splits. Mm -hmm. so yeah. We often have the situation where you have some array X with the features and some array Y with the, uh, uh, with the responses. And then you want to take some random subset of both, but in such a way that you get uh, the like the, the elements in X with the same indexes as the elements in Y. And a, a common pattern that I have found uh, to do that is to uh, pick the output of this A range function to generate um, like the range of all possible indexes, uh, and then shuffle that, and then take the first. 30% of the shuffled uh, range as the indexes to, to take the test samples out of both uh, X and Y, and then take the last third of the shuffled range to take the um, training samples out of both. And that's, uh, that would be one of these uh, fancy indexing methods that Chris mentioned, where basically any uh, integer array can serve as an index. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we can now move on to pandas if no one has questions about NumPy. I still don't see any further questions, so All right. go ahead. I, I managed to figure out how to have the chat open, unlike last time where I was just uh -huh. jailed inside my own window. Okay, nice. Um, the thing about, about NumPy is that a lot of packages build on it, including pandas. Um, remember that NumPy provides a typed container and in data science, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, you often have a feature vector for every data point. Many features are sometimes not the same type and you need some sort of table-like structure that functions like a NumPy array on the column side. So every data point has the same type of feature for a given feature, but not necessarily like a NumPy array on the on the row axis, which is where pandas comes in. It provides a multi-dimensional, usually 2D uh, NumPy array-like structure. We start with the pandas series, which adds dictionary-like behavior on top of a NumPy array. And it uses, a, <laughs> it uses a pandas index object as the keys of that dictionary-like behavior. So if we have data being a pandas series defined with this attribute list, we can call data values on it and we get a NumPy array. But on top of that NumPy array, we have an index. In this case, a range index object. Don't concern yourself much with what, what that is. It's just a, something we can use to, uh, to index this NumPy array. Now, in this case, since it's an integer, it's basically the same thing and you can call, also index it the same way. But if we give it a index of characters, of strings, then we can also do associative indexing like this, like explicit indexing by calling the actual index. Now, the fact that it's similar, as we said, it's not, it, it's dictionary-like, right? It's not like an official way it presents itself. I am a dictionary. No, it's, it's something that behaves like a dictionary. It's one of those duck typing things where it, it be it, in Python, where, where if it behaves enough like something, then for all intents and purposes, it is that. And it's close enough that we can define a pandas series given a dictionary. And if we call pandas.series the function on that dictionary, we get our values indexed by the keys. And these are usually sorted according to what makes sense. So I believe this thing, no, no, it's, it doesn't seem to be sorted. Okay, I might be mistaken. All right. Um, you can also use these ex explicit indices to slice, but notice that when you use explicit indices, unlike integer indices, the upper bound is inclusive. If you were dealing with integers, the, 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 the corresponding integer for Florida would not have been included, but it is included when you index using explicit indices in pandas all over the place in series and in indices in, in data frames. So this index that we have is an immutable array, but that can also act like a set because, well, when you have data frames, see these, you can do joins tile operations that you know. One second, C Chris. Yep. Uh, someone in the set says they can't hear you. I, I could hear you and others can hear you as well. I think it is a, a problem on your end. Whoever yeah. cannot hear, maybe uh, restart audio or something. I wonder if it can hear you, though. Hmm. Okay, so somebody can hear you, but not me. That is odd. Lucky. <laughs> uh, no, I mean the other way around. Yeah. Well, okay, works again. Please continue. Cool. Okay, so the pandas index that added this dictionary functionality to the CDs to the NumPy array is an immutable array. You can't change it once you have it. Like you can't assign to positions. 
and it also acts like a set and these set operations are useful for when you want to perform not explicitly you won't have to deal with it but just to provide you with why it's useful the join sql style on pandas data frames will use these um these operations we can slice it much like a numpy array we can print everything we can print in terms of attributes for pandas array <laughs> We can uh, define two ind indices and perform set operations on them. Intersection, the union, the symmetric difference, all the good stuff. So we're now ready to move on to a data frame. And a data frame is basically one. You can actually turn one series to a data frame or more pandas series that share two index objects, the one that already exists that we looked at, so these um, values, but also add one common-wise. And this whole concept of data frame will be familiar to users of R, since we already had a person inquiring about R who has the data frame as a native data type, if I'm not mistaken, to handle labeled column-oriented data question in the chat, how do I upload a CSV file into Jupyter Notebook? Uh, well, that depends. If you want to upload it using pandas, which we're looking at, you would use pandas.read CSV. Well, you'll notice that there's a read function for most every um, file tab that you will encounter. But particularly, we will use the pandas.read CSV function. And if I int introspect it and bring it up in the pager, you will see how to well, sp customize it to your own CSV yeah, file. I guess um, if the question is more about how to upload the file itself so that you can uh, have it in your notebook, you have to go back to the notebook list view. And there is an upload button at the top that you can use. Ah, I see. Here, of course, is, uh, is what Michael was referring to. This upload yeah. button in your file explorer view. Of course, if that is a file that is already on the internet and has a URL, then the more smooth way to do it is to just uh, download it inside the notebook directly with wget or curl or something. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the cat is not happy that she's not getting any attention. Um, where were we? Yep. Data frames. Labeled column oriented data with two indexes. Indices. I keep wanting to say indexes because sometimes in the literature you when you like when you're talking about like an information retrieval index, it won't be pluralize it as indices, but uh, confusing myself with the word. Um, so we have a dictionary for population, a dictionary for area. And if we convert each one of them into a pandas series, like we saw, so the first series area, the second series population, we can combine them into a data frame and give the column names, so the second index. And if we call that, then we get a data frame. And this is a data frame with columns, whoops, columns and an index. And if we call the index attribute, then we get an object of type, uh, yeah, an object of type object, which is what pandas use, uses for strings. or when things are mixed and it doesn't know what what uh, type to give. And if we call columns, then we get also an index object that uses these keys that we specified when defining the data frame. Um, if we call values on it, then we, in this case, we get a normal vanilla two-dimensional numpy array. And this works nicely if we call, 
let me try this. Uh, sorry. States dot values to get the numpy array, and we call dtype on it, and it's the normal typed numpy array. And this works because all the entries are the same type. But if we add if we add a series called uh, Mayors, I can add a column and that I define a new series, give it its the name in the index entry, so the column name and a new series, and I can just add it, stack them next to each other. And now if I call um, values, this is also a numpy array, but it's D type is object because it's mixed and you won't be able to perform all of the operations that you normally perform in matrices, for example, because it, it's, it has ends as strings. So. So, so you really see that pandas is basically just using numpy on the lower level and just adding that much more functionality to it that makes it a very useful tool. In particular, there are many ways to index a data frame. You can use direct indexing like I did here, but you shouldn't. You should always use these indexer attributes. If you don't, bad things will happen. You'll get a ton of errors, or rather uh, warning messages telling you that this is not good what you're doing. Please use lock or iLock. And I would point you to this part of the um, Pandas documentation for a lot of information about indexing, but different use cases, things that shouldn't be done, things that can be done, things that aren't done anymore because they've deprecated. So just provide a few, very few examples here. So let's remind ourselves what states looks like. If I use the iLock indexer, then I can use integer indexing and slicing much like NumPy arrays. So rows up until, but not including the third row, so the, the fourth row, so index three, zero, one, two, but not including three until New York. Same with columns, population and area. Now remember that if we use explicit indexing, like would happen if we used lock, then things are different because the endpoints are now inclusive. So Florida is included and area is included. Another thing that you'll find yourself using a lot is boolean indexing you can filter rows based on a truth value of true and false let's start by well first showing that you can perform just anything that numpy allows you to perform you can divide arrays element by element let's now define a new column by using the pandas assign function. I have to admit that I don't often use the assign function, but I thought it would be a nice way to, uh, to introduce you to it. And the, where's the thing? There's one thing I want to show you here that lets us do what we're doing here. Column names are keywords, meaning that we can just use them like this. And if we assign a new column density, that is this operation here, population over area, then we get a new column. Now, this doesn't change the initial data frame, it just gives you a new one. So you'd want to uh, overwrite it if you want that, but I'll show you, show you a different way you can do it using the indexer that we looked at. So we define a new column density for all rows and this column. And we want the value of this new column to be the column population divided by the column area. And now if you look at states, we see that we have a density column. Now, if we 
call this call and using log notation and just do something we could have done in NumPy, but I didn't show you. Ask it if it's larger than 100, then it will return a Boolean array of a truth value corresponding to whether or not this inequality is true. So it's obviously false here, false here. This is larger than 100, this is larger than 100, and this isn't. And we can use this pandas series as a mask to index using locks. So if we define mask as this series and we hand it to, to the lock indexer, then it will return a view on the data frame where only the condition that we're interested in is true. If we restrict this to a list of, uh, of columns, so after the comma we give it a list, then we're only interested in the mayors, for example, and the corresponding area of the states they're in. We can do that. If you do the same thing, but remove a second element, but keep it a list, even though it has one element, it will be a pandas data frame with one column. But if you remove this, then you will get a series. So it will return the column as a series. Um, now this is something that I find myself using a lot. I don't know that other people use it. It's not really common, but, and I don't know if they're going to keep it because this is being deprecated in favor of pandas at testing. But for now, this works is that you can import these functions. Yeah, there we go. Future warning. You'll get these when something is usable now, but might be removed from a package in the future. Pandas testing, but I don't think pandas testing has the things I want to show you. Mainly this make data frame and make custom data frame. And if we call the make data frame function, it just gives you a random numerical data frame with four columns and random index. Transpose notation that we saw in NumPy is also valid here. Actually, I'm pretty sure you can do, you can use NumPy functions on data frames. So again, one of the uh, benefits of duct typing, meaning that if an object behaves in the same way, then you can just basically do um, certain things to it that, that aren't explicitly defined. So NumPy doesn't know what a data frame is, but it can transpose it because it behaves enough like a NumPy array. A very useful function that you can call in a data frame is the info function that gives you an overview of how much memory it's using, what D types it is, um, how many null values, meaning missing values. This will be something that you'll have to keep an eye on in your future machine learning career because these are headaches. You can also use described mostly on numerical data frames to get column wise statistics. Notice that this itself is a data frame, by the way. So if we call type on df.describe, it's a data frame. We can calculate correlation. Obviously every row correlates perfectly with itself because it has all the information needed to drive itself. So one, one. If you call a custom data frame, you can specify the number of rows and number of columns, but you can also specify the generating function of the items, the values that are actually inside the rows. And that uses the data underscore gen underscore F. Notice the notation similar to the first Christopher told you, underscores. And we had a question last week or two weeks ago about when you would use Lambda functions. Well, this is a very perfect example of when you would use a Lambda function. You need to give this a function and 
you don't particularly use this function anywhere else in your code. So you can just define an anonymous function. And this function always has to take two attributes, rows and columns. This is defined by data gen f. And in this case, I'm just returning one. So I'll get a five by five data frame with just the element one. I could sum up the inputs to the function. So row zero, column zero, zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one, etc. Again, the interplay between NumPy and data frames and broadcasting, because it's the same size as five, five means we can sample from a normal distribution and just add the values to the to, to the already existing values of the data frame. We could have also used this function inside the data generating function. In this case, I uh, I populate the values with the random normal where where the mean is the row value, so zero one till four and the scale meaning uh meaning the uh sigma um, standard deviation of c let me get that cool correlation on that and we will use this correlation data frame actually no we'll just use a different one um one thing i want to show you that's not particularly um useful for this lecture, but it's interesting if you use uh, Jupyter Notebooks as sort of reporting tool in your job. Let's make a custom data frame, use a uniform distribution where um, values are sampled equally at random between minus two and plus two, which gives us some, <clears throat> excuse me, some positive values, some negative values equally likely. And we if we if we wait let me bring up the introspection view on df.style which is what we'll be using here and it tells us that it contains methods for building a styled html representation of the data frame and what we saw two weeks ago is that the jupyter notebook knows how to handle html natively so if we define a function that takes in a value and returns a color in this case, an HTML code red if the value is negative and black if it's positive, then we can apply this styler to our data frame and um, get an HTML representation that respects that. We can highlight the maximum in much in the same way, column wise. We can chain these together. We can randomly set the precision that is being displayed. One, five, if you're interested in more um, precision, that sort of thing. Um, no, these are all taken from, let me see if I link to that somewhere. Yeah, again, the documentation includes a lot more examples of what you can do. I'm just including a few that are either useful or ugly enough that I found it interesting to include here. Like this one. This one picks one column, specifically this one, and uh, well, it renders them as a, renders the, the, the relative. where have we defined R and C for the data generating function? Uh, we haven't defined them, but the data generating function expects two, uh, two parameters. Let's go back. And, and these are positional. So the first one is row, the second is column. This could have been A and B. So these, you could have just done something like define function a and b and what data generating function does is that it just calls whatever you give it with the first as the current row and the second as the current column so same thing 
so they're just named uh, uh, positional uh, arguments that I just happened to call R and C because I wanted explicit in my head to, to know that R is the rows and C is the column. But again, these aren't very important functions. They're just uh, utility things that I found useful. So we can style a column and to tell it that. Uh, There's another question you might have missed about the random. Ah, whether yeah. the um, interval boundaries are included. So I guess the answer is just look at the doc string. But maybe you can quickly show that. Yeah. Was it uniform? Yeah, you use uniform, yeah. I mean, it's very unlikely that it will give you the balance, I'm, I'm sure. It does. Low is included, high is not, just like it says there. Oh, uh, where are you looking? Sorry. I'm... Uh, the, the second paragraph, basically, under the, under the function name at the very top. Indeed. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. Ah, it's, uh, I changed the data frame. Where did I define this data frame? Here. Useful, uh, or chart sort of, um, Representation, good for just, just a quick glance on your data set or for reporting if, if you happen to, uh, to need that sort of thing. And this is just, just taken from the documentation that I just showed you, which shows you how you can further customize using HTML your data frame in a nice way. Uh, one last thing I want to look at for pandas is what the few operations that you can perform in data frames. Now, you won't be using scikit-learn much because the point of this class is for you to well, basically be able to come up with the functions that you find and, and class you find inside scikit-learn. But there are some utilities that are particularly interesting, such as these little uh, toy data sets that you can import that are available in your Jupyter environment and the Python uh, module is installed. Uh, there is the data set called the Iris data set that is a toy example that's used in many machine learning examples. We'll load the Iris data set using load Iris as frame equals true to tell it we want a data frame and not just a NumPy array. And if we look at the type, we get this weird bunch type but thankfully for duck typing, if we look at it, it looks like a dictionary and it probably behaves like one. So we can call uh, keys on it. One of the keys is description. Let's call it that. This is ugly because the display method doesn't seem to handle this well. So let's explicitly call print on it and you get a description of the IDIS data set. So this is a quick data set you can use if you want to try out things you learn in class. It's small enough to, to not be too demanding, but useful enough to be able to uh, be used to elucidate concepts. So there's 100, there are 150 data points, 150 different um, instances. There are three classes. So this is a classification task like the ones we talked about today in class, but this is a multi-class classification where only one class can be true as opposed to binary classification. Um, you know, summary statistics, references, that sort of thing. We can get the target names. So these are three sorts of flowers. And for every flower we have four different physical attributes, the length and width of the petal and the length and width of the sepal. 
Um, and using that, the task would be to be able to see a flower you haven't seen before and based on these four attributes, try and predict what sort of species it is. Is it Setosa, is it Versicolor, or is it Virginica? Let's use the data frame object that the load data set gave us. Um, it's what you'd expect. Every data point has four values and a target. Now we know that the target is only going to be one of three, zero, one, two, but if we wanted to, we could have said df target which returns the series object and a series object has a unique function that tells you how many unique elements are in that particular series. Another interesting one would have been the value underscore counts, which tells us that there are 50, so pretty balanced data set, which is what makes it also useful for learning. We can also call info to get the same information we saw in the description. We can describe the data frame numerically, correlation matrix. Um, we can apply a function. Remember the axes that we saw earlier, namely this image here, which applies to data frames. The axis equals zero. It's the row axis. So it will apply a function row by row for a given column. Or if you choose the one axis, it will apply the, the function that you wanted to apply column by column for the given row. Now let's call the apply function that we can call in pandas. Let me just find. Uh, dum, dum, dum. Again, we use a lambda function. The function that we want to apply takes in a column. Since x is equals zero, it's applying things row by row for a given column and it returns its mean. And you could have also, not that it makes much sense in this instance to calculate the mean over different features but if your use case demanded it then you could have done it row by row so the mean for each row which again isn't meaningful in this particular instance is returned as a series as well indexed by the row um, now let's use the apply function that we just saw to replace. Let's look at the DF data frame for a second. What I would like to do is replace this here, zero, one, two, with the actual names of the, uh, of the flowers. So, uh, Remember that we had this target names array with zero representing Setosa, one Versicolor, and two Virginica. So if we have a certain target number, we can index into it. So if we just apply a function, not a function, rather, but, uh, um, yeah, an anonymous function that indexes this target name according to what is in the target column, meaning that i for i equals zero, one, two. Let me escape, press m to turn this into a markdown, but little refresher. And remember that if I call a series, if I index using lock with, sorry, with, um, with one column name, then I get a series. And if you get a series, then you don't have to, to worry about axes because there is only one axis. 
meaning that we can call the apply function and do this thing here. And the input to this lambda function x is whatever you know what is currently in it. So if we index using this x, the input to the function and provide the output target names of x, then we get what we want. And we can use that to either um, reassign this column, which I will do here, but you can also do something like target names and add a different column. And we can see our target function here. Uh, our target column here has the names like I wanted it to have. And uh, an annoying thing that that we have here is these column names have these spaces and parentheses and all the this useless information. And you can use the rename function that you can call on a data frame and provide with a dictionary with old value, new value for every column that you want to change. And if we do that, we can see that a data frame is displayed with the new column names. However, df hasn't changed. This is because this is a new data frame, not the old one. And in a lot of functions that return data frames, you can add this attribute in place equals true to basically do the work for you. So reassigning the data frame with whatever change the function that you're currently calling is doing. So if I call in place equals true, df will actually be changed. Um, that's it for pandas. If there are any questions, remarks, things I missed, Michael? Can't think of anything. Thank you very much for this. This was quite comprehensive. <laughs>